<laughs> Hello and welcome everyone to Norfolk Developers last event of the year. I'm Mez and I'll be your host for this evening. Our, our speaker tonight is Roger, um, the chairman of NAS, and he'll be telling us about the James Webb Telescope. I've just got a few slides to get through with a few updates before we hand over to Roger. So we already have some events lined up for next year. The first one is introduction to knowledge graphs on the 7th of January. And then the next one is how I cheated at my son's homework on the 21st of January. <laughs> we also have many more talks in the pipeline. Uh, tomorrow night we'll be doing our virtual social club from 5.30 till late. Feel free to drop in anytime and say hi. And thank you to the user story who are our sponsor for our Discord server. We're also still looking for a corporate sponsor. So if anyone's interested, please get in touch. And thank you to our Patreons. Um, we couldn't keep this going without you. Right, and that's my bit done. So let's hand over to oh, Roger. Wow. Wow. <coughs> okay. Nice animation at the end there. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Roger and I'm chairman of Norwich Astronomical Society, as you've already seen. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you tonight about something that's had a bit of a name makeover. Uh, it is now officially called the Webb Telescope. This is, this is an edict that's just been handed down by NASA they have decided that James Webb Space Telescope is a bit too complicated. And so therefore, in future, it's going to be known as the Webb Telescope, which is pretty confusing, I have to say, because there are a lot of things that use the word Webb, as you may have noticed. So anyway, that's what it's now called. And that's what I will be using this evening. Now, if you have any questions, can you use the chat uh, button and I'll see if I can answer any of the questions at the end. If not, I'll do the time honored thing of saying, that's a very good question. I'll get back to you on it. Is that okay, everyone? Right, good. So what I'm going to do now is start the presentation. You should see a screen that says ready and waiting to start. Okay, folks, good. Right. You'll see the logo on the left a lot. It's the Astro Boost logo, which is used regularly. Whoops, speed of the hands. Okay, folks, yeah. So that was Astro Boost and that was welcome. And I had operator finger trouble there. So hopefully that will be the only time tonight. So this is astronomer's heaven. This is the kind of night sky we would all love to see. Unfortunately, it's pretty rare, especially uh, increasingly because of light pollution, and, and at the moment, of course, cloud as well. But there are still areas not far from us here where we have pretty good night skies when it is clear. Uh, our own observatory is not that far away from the border with Suffolk. It's at, um, quite, quite near Seelin. And um, this image is partly of part of the Milky Way, as you can see, you might think there's a lot of lights on the horizon. That's purely because of the exposure time on the camera. In fact, it's a very dark area. So it really sums up what the kind of thing we like to see. 
and particularly no full moon, so we can see a lot of the dark sky as well. And the thing you've got to remember is that for most of human history, this is what people saw. There were no telescopes, there, were, there was nothing like that. It was all done with the naked eye. So, and what, what for, for most of human history people didn't know was it was a very limited part of what they could actually see. So naked eye can only see that small part of what is known as the electromagnetic spectrum that you can see here, going from gamma rays at the top right down to long radio waves at the bottom. And it's purely inside that small section that our entire knowledge of the universe, up until really the after the Second World War, was based, was completely based. Simply mm -hmm. like that part that we could see. Mm -hmm. And then saw an email Ellen sent to the Rita Tech mailbox. I didn't. So we've got a limited view of the universe. And what's visible from the surface of the Earth? Well, this is the area in the visual spectrum that we can just about see down to the surface of the Earth. And of course, this is the radio spectrum. And this became knowledge, as it were, after the Second World War. And that was mainly as a result of the technologies such as, such as radar and electronics and so that had been developed during the war for military purposes but were then used and lo and behold there was another window on the universe and a very wide one as well as you can see and we've even got a, a, a radio telescope at the Sebian Observatory which has actually been constructed by members themselves. Um, it is extremely frustrating for them to operate it because you get all kinds of spurious signals and it's been a very steep learning curve for them so far. Hopefully not for much longer. So I'm just going to go very briefly through what is now the more or less generally accepted uh, concept on how the universe began and how it's expanded since, known as the Big Bang Theory, clearly because there was a Big Bang. Um, when I was in my 20s, there was still a lot of debate about this, and there was a steady state theory as well, which believed that the universe had always been and would carry on like it was. Um, data collected over the years have, had more or less shown that that wasn't the case. So the Current thinking is that the Big Bang happened, as you see at the bottom, about 13.7 billion years ago. The actual bang and afterwards is not accessible. It's simply too far back and there isn't anything to see. As you can see from the rather cunningly named Dark Ages on part of your screen there. The earliest that we could hope to see is the formation of the first stars, which is highlighted in this red line here. And it is from then on that we are going to be talking about this evening. There's a second line, which is when stars started forming galaxies. And that is a, a, a main interest of the Webb telescope. So we'll be talking something about that as well. So, you remember slide, slide five, I think it was, uh, that was the one that showed you what you can see on the earth and how limited that is. Well, of course, one of the main way of getting around that is, is to go above a planet um, and to put telescopes into orbit. Now that does two things. First of all, of course, it gets you above the atmosphere and all the turbulence in the atmosphere and all the clouds and so on and so forth. But secondly, of course, it allows you to see the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And what we found over the years since um, orbital flight became 
fairly straightforward, is a whole range of telescopes. So we've got ultraviolet telescopes, we've got X-ray telescopes, and we've got infrared telescopes. Now, the largest telescope that's around at the moment and is in orbit is the Hubble Space Telescope. This is mainly a visual spectrum telescope. So it's taking images that if you had the chance, you could actually see the same kind of thing from the surface of the Earth. It's a very traditionally designed telescope. On the right hand end of the cylinder is a primary mirror, which focuses the incoming light down to the left hand end of the tube and then is sent up to the side for examination and processing. The Hubble was launched in 1990 and is still operating as we speak. And there is one important difference between the Hubble and the telescope we're going to be talking about just now, and that is the fact that the Hubble could be serviced. As you can see, this image was actually taken during, I think it was the last servicing mission. It, Hubble could only really be uh, serviced by the space shuttle, and once the space shuttle was retired, Basically, you can't do any more servicing, although there have been plans to actually construct a robotic system that could possibly service it. We'll see anyway. Now, the Hubble, of course, looks at all kinds of objects. It's extremely difficult to get time on the Hubble. You have to have a really good case and you have to submit that case a long time in advance. The other thing is the, the Hubble operators reserve to themselves a certain amount of time for things that they want to do with themselves. And famously, the director of the Space Telescope Institute, which uh, controls the Hubble, was allocated certain small time slots, which he put together. And so he then got the telescope pointed at a point in the, in the sky, which there hardly seemed to be anything going on at all. And they left the telescope pointing at this part of the sky for days and days and days. So they got a lot of exposure. And in the end, they ended up with a precursor of what we're seeing here. This is a second one. This is the ultra, ultra deep field. There's been another one since then. But let me just put this in perspective. What we're talking about here is something which is about, if you, if you were to hold your hand out and hold a large P in your hand and look into the night sky, that's about the same field of view that we're actually talking about here. And within this field of view, there are 2000 galaxies. Now the stars have been processed out. All you're seeing are galaxies, that's entire, structures of stars, millions and millions and billions of stars, and 2,000 of them in that small area itself. So that's pretty mind-blowing in its own right. Now, one of the things about this image is this. This galaxy here appears to be red in colour. As you can see, there are a number of the others. And we think that the oldest ones are, as you can see, the date on the right-hand side. The oldest ones are red-shifted. So the question is, why do they appear in that color? So let's just have a look at that. Now, the effect of redshift is typically, we use the example of a, an emergency vehicle approaching you and then going past and then going the other way. The note changes, it comes towards you and then changes in the other direction as it goes away. Now that is sound, of course, but exactly the same thing applies for light. So you get shifting depending on the object that you're looking at is coming towards you or receding from you. Now, if it's receding from you, the light becomes redshifted. And the further away you are, the more it gets redshifted. And of course, in the end, because it's outside the visual spectrum, you won't see it at all. 
the other thing about this is that if you're looking at a, a, a distant galaxy, for example, I'm just going to move this. If you're looking at a, at a distant galaxy, for example, in any spectrum that you're looking at, there will be lines. And the lines in the spectrum indicate elements that are in the light coming from that particular far off object. And as you can see here, what happens the further away when you get the redshift is the spectrum lines themselves get shifted. So you can tell what's in the spectrum, but it's, it's all shifted. Now, shifting uh, was really uh, determined by Edwin Hubble. And it was Edwin Hubble who realized that, was the first person to realize that there were galaxies outside our own galaxy. So that's probably why he gets a telescope named after him. So the redshift. And now, um, can I just explain? I wanna, yes, okay, I'm gonna do some, yeah, that's fine. Okay, why infrared astronomy is needed? Right, now you've got two images here. Now, funnily enough, these are, these are two images of the same object, which is a nebula. Uh, nebula is just a fancy word for cloud. In fact, it's, it's the Latin for cloud. Molecular clouds, dust clouds, as they were originally called, at first were thought by visual astronomers to be just an absolute pain, that they just got in the way of what you could see. In fact, what we now know is that they have got a lot of activity going on in the clouds themselves. And this can be seen in the infrared rather than in the visual spectrum. And you can see here, this is the same object viewed at the bottom in visual light and the top in infrared. And you can see how different the same structures look. And there are things that you can see in the top image that you can't see in the bottom image. Now, originally, of course, um, this chart has come from NASA, and I've, ever since I first saw it, I've had a bit of a problem understanding its structure along the x-axis. Um, in fact, if you see, it says time after the Big Bang, and then right over on the right-hand side, these are just the millions of years after the Big Bang. To me, it's I find it fairly difficult to interpret it. It's a bit like a, a, a lot of the COVID-19 graphs that have been produced. But anyway, so up until 1990, that is as far back as we can see, about eight, about six billion years before the Big Bang. The Hubble increased that purely because of the fact it was above the atmosphere. So you got back to 1.5 billion years. Now, in one of the service missions on the Hubble, they swapped in a near infrared camera. So its range, as it were, was then extended so it could see into the red. In other words, it could take account of some of the red shifting that had been taking place. And as you can see from here, there were two stages of that. The image I've just shown you was the 2004 one, and they tweaked it even more to get right back as far as you can see there. So about 480 billion years uh, after the Big Bang. And it is intended that the web will go back even further because it's looking further into the infrared and it's a much bigger telescope. Now, the, the Webb isn't the first infrared telescope. The very first one was, as shown your IRIS, and that was launched way back in 1983. One of the most successful ones is the one at the bottom, which is the Herschel Space Observatory. Um, all, uh, paid for, constructed, and launched by the European Space Agency in 2009. And as you can see from the left-hand image, 
it's a pretty big telescope. It is out at an orbit, which is not an orbit around the Earth. It's an orbit around the sun, and it's called the L2 Lagrange orbit, which is 1.5 million kilometers or just under a million miles away. It's a very stable orbit. And as you'll see later, it has great advantages for the kind of observations that the web is intended to do. And there's another point about this is that the Herschel was launched by an earlier version of the same spacecraft that is going to launch the web. And the Herschel got to the orbit pretty well. One other thing about this slide is you'll see there's the word coolant appears a lot. Now with infrared instruments, you want to get away from the noise level, electronic noise levels. And a lot of the detectors work best, they lower the temperatures. And with a couple of these telescopes, you can see the temperature was really, really low. And in fact, IRAS, it was only two degrees Kelvin above absolute zero. The problem with this is you've only got a limited supply of the coolant. In fact, with IRAS, only lasted for eight months. It was only designed to last for that long, but it, it wasn't sustainable to keep it going any longer. And the other unusual thing about IRAS was it was in orbit around the Earth, fairly close in which means that it would get a lot of heat noise and infrared noise uh, reflecting back from the surface of our planet. But out at 1.5 million kilometers, you don't have any of those problems at all. You still have the problem with coolant. And if you're going to put a telescope that far out for a long time, you've either got to have a lot of coolant or you've got to have another way of dealing with it. which takes us on in a moment, I'm jumping the gun slightly here. First of all, I thought it would be really nice to see what infrared images look like. The top one is from Iris and the All Sky Survey. So in actual fact, what it's looking at is the plane of our galaxy from our position in it. And you wouldn't get that in any other way. Now the the lower one, the Andromeda galaxy has got, no, the Milky Way galaxy, sorry, it's got two smaller associated galaxies. This one that you see here at the bottom, you cannot see uh, from where we are because it's a southern hemisphere object. But that is looking at the small Magellanic cloud in the infrared. So already you're getting an enormous amount of information simply by using infrared. So, a bigger telescope, in fact, a much bigger telescope. And here it is, it doesn't look that much like a traditional telescope, I must say. Uh, just a couple of points about the slide. First of all, it's a much bigger mirror than the Hubble. Uh, the Hubble was launched as a single entity. It was taken up in the carrier bay of the Space Shuttle. You couldn't possibly do that with a telescope of this size. You wouldn't have a space vehicle big enough to actually launch it without previously having folded it up. So that's one of the first issues that the designers had to deal with. So it's using infrared light. Um, it's a noiseless location for orbit. That is, it is untroubled by any kind of electronic noise or chatter from the Earth itself. But it has to fit into the launch vehicle. It wouldn't matter what launch vehicle it was, it's got to fit inside it. Um, in fact, the telescope is, is more traditional than you might think. If you look at the actual main mirror itself, in front of it, on the right hand side, there is the what's called the secondary, secondary mirror. So the light goes to the primary mirror and gets bounced back into the secondary mirror and then back 
down into that central cone you can see which is where all the instrumentation is. And the reason the telescope is named as it is, as you can see here, James Webb was the head of NASA from 61 to 68. This was a, a time of critical development, particularly with manned space flight, because the Mercury, Gemini, and the early Apollo flights took place all under his watch. And by general consent, he really was the right person for doing the job at the time. So you get to get a telescope named after yourself, which is nice. So the Webb telescope clearly is a scientific instrument, so it has a number of goals. And the goals are to look for the earliest stars and galaxies, to map the evolution of galaxies now that uh, screen I showed you earlier, which showed the Big Bang and afterwards, you can see that galaxies started appearing at a certain time, and then later on, they would have been uh, more clustered together and more enfolded with each other. So by looking at time shots, you were able to see how the galaxies evolved. And thirdly, Leading on from that, the other thing is you get the stars, but then some of the stars, in fact, we now know most of the stars start forming planetary systems. And in the same kind of way, by time stamping, that you can study the evolution of galaxies, you can have a look at how stars and planets are formed. And you'll see a bit more about that shortly. The fourth uh, goal is not really tied in uh, with the first three. It is, in fact, um, the searching for exoplanets. Now, exoplanets are planets that go around other stars. And there has been a huge revolution, as I'm sure you know, in that, in that there are now over 4,300 have been catalogued in a very small area of the sky. So there are clearly a, a lot of planetary systems out there. A lot, of, well, most of them were discovered by the image you see on the left, which is a space telescope, the Kepler space telescope, which in fact clocked about three and a half thousand of them before it was retired a couple of years ago. Now, the telescopes like the Kepler could only detect the exoplanets. They didn't have sufficient resolution and they weren't designed to do it to be able to qualify or quantify any of the atmospheres of these planets. And that's what we're really interested in because planets that um, can sustain um, life would have particular telltale signatures in their atmospheres. So that's a thing that the web is particularly intended to look at. Uh, can you just bear with me for a, a minute? I just want to have a look at it. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, um, everybody, I take it is okay so far, just just stick a thumb up if you if you can hear and you haven't fallen asleep yet. If you have fallen asleep, of course, I won't be able to tell. So that's okay. Right, now what I'm going to do now is stop this share and I am going to go into another screen share. Just bear with me for just a moment. Yes. Um, what I'm going to do first, can you talk amongst yourselves for just a minute while I just go back to this? Because what I'm going to do is share this. And what I'm going to do is go back to the very first one that I was using, which is a good idea. So we're going back to there and we're going to do this. So can everybody see M? Well, I hope everybody can see M51, the Whirlpool galaxy, as you can see, it's called that because of its shape. It's actually two galaxies. There's one on the right-hand side. 
it was thought for a long time that this was in some way attached or been eaten even, which is a rather dramatic phrase to apply to galaxies. Uh, we now think that they are passing each other and that material is being sucked from one to the other. Now, just a very brief explanation about why I keep talking about things that sound as if they're actual, actual motorways. Um, this one is M51. It's a catalogue. It's called the Messier catalogue, and it was originally constructed by a French astronomer, Charles Messier, in the 1780s. Um, he worked for the French Admiralty, and he had one of his jobs cataloguing the night sky for navigation purposes. He was also a comet hunter as well. And as he was going around the night sky, night after night, a lot more clear skies in those days, um, he kept coming across the same objects time and time again, and he got really fed up with doing this. So he catalogued them, and they said, in future, I won't need to look at them. And these are the Messier uh, objects. They go from one up to 100, 108, I think it is. And that catalog is still used now. Um, if you have a telescope, which is what's called a go-to telescope, so it has a handset, and on it, it's, it is a cheat in a way, in the sense that you don't really need to know where anything is in the night sky. All you do is enter the number on your handset, and a telescope will actually go to it. And so that's basically what happens with this catalog. Catalogs built in, you want to find M51, you just type in the 51, and the telescope will marvelously swing around and point at M51. You probably won't see it in the kind of detail that you can see it here. Although several of my colleagues have got some pretty good photographs about it. Now, this image is in visual light. So if it was, if you were looking at, at our observatory, you wouldn't see the color because human eyes don't see the color. If you process it, if you take the image and then process it, so you're bringing out all the different frequencies that the human eye isn't able to see at night, this is what it would look like in the visual spectrum. Now, what I'm going to do now is move further along here. And as I move further along, you can see the appearance of this object ch changes radically. And it's picking up different parts of the structure. And in fact, in the far, in the mid infrared, so the frequency is very different, you can see that you can see the structure in completely different ways from how you would actually be seeing it if you were looking at it from the surface of the Earth. Let's just go back again, just to show you the last one, which is, I know this is a slight artifact of the system, but, and so let's go back to the original. So that I think is a very graphic demonstration of what happens when you look at something in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, particularly in visual light and in infrared. Now, what I'm going to do now is move this back over a bit. So I've got I cunningly got a number of bookmarks here. And I want to show you this one. Now, what this is, um, if, you, if it was a clear sky this evening and you were out after about eight o'clock at night in uh, out in the countryside in a north dark sky area, you would see what is one of the most marvelous sights in the night sky, which is the Orion, uh, Orion the Hunter, the constellation of Orion. It's a winter gal it, it, galaxy. It's a winter constellation, doesn't appear in the summer. It's always like an old friend coming back towards the end of October. It starts poking its head above the horizon fairly late in the evening. And by now, it will be fairly prominent in the evening. Orion the Hunter is a classical thing. Um, it's got, he's got two shoulders, and then he's got a sword belt. It's the only three stars in the entire night sky that are in a diagonal. 
So if you can see those three stars in a diagonal, you know you're looking at Orion the Hunter. The top left-hand star, the one shoulder, it's either that shoulder or that shoulder, that is the red supergiant, supergiant Betelgeuse, otherwise known as Betelgeuse. And there were excited rumors last year that it was going to blow up. However, things have gone back to more or less normal now. So that excitement itself is going to be for some future generation. Just below the sword belt, the sword dangles down and halfway down it, there's a little blob. Now this blob is a nebula. It's the great nebula in Andromeda. And it's also got a Messier number M42. And if you look at that, even with a visual telescope, you get a really nice image. Not as big as this one, but quite a big one. If you go really big telescope and you end up with this image, which has been processed, the, the reason I'm showing you this is this is a star nursery. So inside this area, new stars are being born. It's a mixture of molecular clouds and so on and so forth. And gravity is pulling parts of the cloud material together. Eventually, it will heat up sufficiently and then pull more in. The gravity will get stronger and you will end up with some kind of creation. So. I'm just going to stop the share for a moment and then go back into it. Um, and a bit of operator finger trouble there, but don't let it worry you. Here we are. So what we're going to do now, ah, that's what I should have done, done. So what we're going to do now is go on to the next bookmark. Yep. And this is this is Orion again, as you can see. Now, what, remember I said it was a star nursery, and it is. And what is happening at these different points is that star formation is taking place. Now, these are baby stars, so they're only a few million years old. But this is where the star formation is actually taking place. And further back in time, you would be able to look earlier if you were looking in infrared at objects that were much further away. Now, remember I, I mentioned earlier that one of the intentions of the science exploration of the Webb telescope is to look at planetary formation. So let's go to here. And what we're going to do with this is expanded so you can see a visualization of the formation of a planetary system from basically the star in the center and then material begins to coalesce and form planets and this is the way in which we think our own solar system was actually formed now with an infrared telescope, which we're going back further to the time of planetary formations um, in other galaxies or even um, in other parts of our galaxy that are a long way away, we should be able to see different aspects of the star formation. And that's really important because we can then, we've constructed a number of computer models about how this works, but it will be really nice to actually see the thing itself. So that's that one. Now the rest of the science is to do with, remember the number four of the things I showed you was actually, just bear with me a minute, I'm going to stop this and start it again because I want it in full size. It likes to get started immediately, that's why it's called interactive of course. But let's just do it like this. So this is the light coming from a star. A planet is passing in front of it. And as you can see, there's a dip in the light. And the Kepler telescope uses this transit method to actually, let's just stop it here. 
uses the transit method to simply detect the presence of the planet. That's what its task was. And it couldn't resolve things any more than that. If you've got a much bigger telescope, you might be able to not only do that, but also image any atmosphere that that particular planet happens to have. And that is going to be one of the major tasks of the Webb telescope to actually do that. And finally, the other one I want to show you is this. So what we have here is the air spectrum, as you can see. And the important thing about this, so this is just a test of what we're looking for. What we're looking for, what signatures are we looking for, which would tend to indicate um, some form of or organic life activity uh, in the atmosphere of a particular planet. And of course, in the infrared, you're looking at these kind of signatures you can see shown here, water vapor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that is the, the fourth of the um, tasks that the, have, that the Webb telescope has been set to really try and look at that. If everyone's okay so far, I'm just going to carry on. I'll go back to the other slide system now, which is a nice blank screen. We all like a blank screen. So that's this is this is the one we've just seen. Okay. I'm not sure we all like a a, a blue screen. Uh, uh, <laughs> right. This is a this is a bit of what's called revision. So penetrating the dust clouds, star formation, pleasure planetary disks, which I've just shown you, and also extrasolar planetary atmospheres. Now um, Alex hasn't told me how I should distribute the questionnaires at the end of the talk, you know, just to test what, what so I mean, I don't think I'll be marking them before Christmas. <laughs> Sorry. Right, let's go on. Ah, here we are. Here I is. Everyone, I think everyone will have their pack in their emails. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Here we are. Here's the blank screen that I was promising you. Um, you can say it for, for just a moment, I have a drink of water, I should add. Right, now what we're going to do now is go on to the actual telescope itself. Oh, word, yes. So, primary mirror of the telescope. It's enormous. In fact, these are only six of the 18 segments. Um, it looks a bit odd around the edges. It doesn't look like a mirror, uh, but that can be dealt with in, by the image processing that actually takes place. They are gold-plated. Uh, the reason they're gold-plated is because of all the elements that we have, Gold is the most highly reflective in the infrared. And in fact, it's got about a 98, 99% reflectivity rate. So it is well worth that. Uh, th this isn't heavy gold in the sense that it's, um, it's gold vapor. Um, there's a fairly complicated process of vacuum sealing uh, uh, gold vapor onto the mirror, as you can see here. So that's just a, a small part of the mirror itself. And this is the entire mirror, as you can see here. It's 6.5 meters in diameter. Now, just as an example of size compared with others, the one in the center is the main mirror of the Hubble Space Telescope. One on the left, which is a much smaller mirror, there was a, another infrared telescope, which I hadn't mentioned so far, 
which has just been retired, which is called the Spitzer. So that gives you some idea of the sheer size of the mirror. So bearing in mind where it's going to be and not able to use coolant, how do we protect the telescope? The answer is with a sun shield. Um, and to be fair, a very complicated sun shield. You can see part of it here. It's in five segments and it all extends out. And it should keep the cold side of the telescope at that temperature that you can see here. And there's also some in internal coolant as well, but it's quite sparingly used because the telescope has a design lifetime of between six to 10 years. So it, most of the cooling has to take place by a means that does not involve coolant. And out at the Lagrange orbit, it is possible to use the sun shield like this. So that is basically how the telescope is shielded. The telescope, of course, is got a lot of scientific instruments within it. So this is the overall science module. Um, it sits within the telescope and it is mounted on carbon struts. Um, using that kind of system, it probably means that there is little thermal fluctuation, which of course you can't afford to have. Just as an aside, um, there, on this project, no one's ever had any problem wearing masks because they've been wearing masks for years, as you can see. Because obviously clean roomy environment and so on and so forth. So this engineering uh, system includes the infrared camera, which of course is essential, and a spectrograph. So we're trying to quantify what's in an atmosphere of planet, qualify what's in an atmosphere of planet. We need to use the spectrograph to do so. And here's the camera itself. And I quite like this image because it gives you some idea of the size of everything and the sheer amount of work that's gone into it. I mean, just look at that wiring system uh, on the main buster. And the infrared telescope itself is here. It's the item in yellow that's just been lowered and everyone is really praying that it will fit, which it did. And the prime contractor for the infrared camera was the University of Arizona. So, and here is the instrument that processes an awful lot of the mid infrarange stuff. The reason I have highlighted this one is the prime contractor for this was the European Space Agency. And as part of that, there were two UK institutions that were heavily involved in this, Rutherton Appleton Laboratory and the Royal Observatory Edinburgh. Now, ROE has a long experience of remote control operation of instruments. They have a couple of telescopes in Hawaii that are operated remotely these days, much to the disgust of people who used to go out there to operate them because not only did they have this um, detached duty for a year or so, but amazingly enough, under the terms and conditions of the Research Council, they got a hardship allowance as well. So this was a, a very popular posting, as you can imagine. So, so that's the MIRI, and that is an essential part. Of the all these parts have now been integrated, of course, they're all in the telescope. And of course, the thing we tend to forget when we're talking about the telescope all the time is the this is a spacecraft. So we've got a spacecraft bus, and that includes orientating the entire unit, communications with Earth, data handling, and the whole thing. 
And that is what this is. This is the way the spacecraft bursts. So everything else is inside this that we've just been talking about. And because of our audience this evening, I thought I'd better include this one as well. So it uses, obviously uses solid state memory. Now, if you were to look at the modules involved, you might say to yourself, they're almost obsolete. They look a bit, you know, yesterday's design. Two reasons for that. Of course, they are yesterday's design, obviously. But also the other thing is, what you've got to remember is where they are when they're in space. They not only have to be tolerant of the extreme temperature fluctuations, but also the hard radiation as well. And you often find with computer systems that are used in spacecraft that they look a bit, you know, passe, old fashioned, over large. Uh, one of the reasons for that is, of course, that if you miniaturize them down to the extent that you might want to do these days, you could almost end up with relativistic effects on the storage uh, media itself, because there are all these cosmic ray particles flying around out in space and so on and so forth. So the computer is the grandly named CTP, Command Telemetry Processor, which is a very snappy title indeed. Uh, I think you, you, you probably knew this already, but NASA is an extreme, is an acronym rich environment, it really is. So it uses something which most of us probably don't do, which is a real-time operating system. And the real-time operating system used is VxWorks, which is, uh, has been developed right from the 19, late 1980s by the splendidly named Wind River Systems in the States. And it's got a good pedigree and a good track record. So it's used a lot by NASA, it's used by SpaceX, SpaceX use it on their Dragon spacecraft and Airbus use it in particularly related to the Ariane spacecraft. Um, it's in operation at the moment because the um, Persevere Mars lander that's heading for Mars at the moment also runs VxWorks. So, and it's going to, you can see what's a real time operating system because of the descent and entry into the atmosphere and landing on Mars, there's a lot of events that have to take place very quickly. Raytheon have got in on the, in on the act as well. So the communicator telemetry systems use their software. Again, it's been used for a long time in this area. The signals pass to the Deep Space Communications Network, which there are three main ground stations on Earth geographically separated to the extent that there is always coverage with at least one of them. And the web is run, uh, pointed, etc., targeted by the Space Telescope Science Institute. This is the one that was set up to manage the Hubble. So it's obviously under expansion at the moment because it's going to be dealing with, hopefully dealing with two telescopes rather than one. And so what we're going to do now is go Back to the animations again, uh, just for a short time. So we'll be doing three of them, as you can see here. Uh, so how will it get there? Where is the fun orbit and why is it at the 1.5 million kilometers away from Earth? And the fun bit, how does the telescope get unfolded from the spacecraft? So just bear with me again for just a moment. Okay, there we were. So what we're going to do now is go to the, go to the, hmm. well, where are we? James Webb Space Coast, that's it. Okay, share. Okay, so what we're going to do now is go to the next one, which is, that one. Just go on in a sec. Uh, here we are. Right. This is the launch vehicle, Ariane 5 ECA, which is the extended version of the Ariane launch vehicle. Great track record, that 98 straight 100% successful launches. 
so the European Space Agency has contracted to launch the web uh, from South America, as you can see from Kourou. Now, you can see here, there's a, quite a bit of folding up that's gone on to actually fit the um, spacecraft inside the shroud of the rocket. So one thing that I always like to do on these occasions is have a bit of a launch. Plus Attention pour le décompte final. So final count Dix, coming up. Eight, seven, five, four, three, so imagine it's next two, year, one, October next year. Two. Here we go. First of all, the main Allez, engines, the Vulcan engines are lit up. Then the external booster is ignited. Decollage takeoff. So away she goes. And there will be a few people having their arms, legs, fingers, everything crossed next October, hopefully, so we can see a site like this, which will be a compulsive YouTube viewing, I would imagine, for a lot of people. So, now, next question up is, I love the sound, I love that sound, you know, I'm going to stop it now. Good. So, just move over a bit. And the question, next question is, why the orbit? So, let's have a look. Stand by for a nice little bit of American commentary. Far beyond the orbit of the moon around the Earth, the James Webb Space <laughs> Telescope will be placed yeah, in orbit yeah, yeah. at a distance of one million it, miles. It's an interesting Earth. old graphic. This location is known as the L2 point, or second Lagrange point. This special orbit will keep the sun, earth, and moon in a direct line from the spacecraft and behind the heat shield, regardless of where it is while orbiting. From this unique perch, the Webb Space Telescope will follow the earth as it revolves around the sun, keeping its sensitive instruments protected while permitting it to make unprecedented observations. There we are. Thanks for the commentary. Uh, but uh, that really does quite usefully explain why the telescope is going where it is. So what we're going, we've got one more of these to do. So what I'm going to do now is just pull up the last one, which is, aha. Now, watch this carefully. Here we go. This is the, unf oh, sorry about this. Let me just um, mm, 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 speed of the hand, deceive the eye then. Oh, don't worry, I'll start this bit again. Right, let's go back to here. Let's go back to share. Let's stop it and take it back really to the start. Okay. So the, the web has arrived, okay, in its orbit. This is what happens next. Now, all of this has got to work. So that's the comms link opening up. And here is the first bit of the sun shield. The sun shield opens out both sides, as you can see. Then the central bit, I was going to say, raises up. And then the sun shield starts deploying because basically the sun shield has got to be big enough to form a shield. You see, you see the vertical pillars, they're used to ratchet the different layers. You can see to ratchet the different layers of the sun shield up. And remember, there are five altogether, and this will ratchet up so that the, they're thermally separated from each other. And that will be the five of them operating together. And then the unfolding begins. So the secondary mirror is pointing back. And then the rest of the mirror opens up. And there we are. Now, yes. 
it'll be interesting to watch this happening. It, I mean, in some ways, it's no more complicated than, uh, for example, when the European Space Agency spacecraft landed on Titan. That was a pretty complicated maneuver in its own right, but it's all got to work. So that's the biggest problem, obviously, with it. So you'll be relieved to hear we've only got another couple of slides. And AstroBoost. Now, AstroBoost was started by NASA. It is the Web Telescope Outreach Program. The reason, one of the main reasons for it is because people need to, these telescopes cost a lot of money and NASA feels that people need to know about it and need to know about it particularly. The other thing is, of course, this is the first large infrared telescope that's been uh, put out into, into that far out in orbit. And also a lot of the initial images are going to appear are going to be in the infrared. And people aren't used to seeing things in the infrared. To that end, the UK's subcontractor for Astro Boost is the Royal Astronomical Society. And the lead administrator of the program uh, in the UK is the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh. Um, and the present version is known as AstroBoost Plus because it's the one that's now building up to the actual launch of the telescope. One of the things that ROE did was they, they identified that one of the means of bringing the news of the telescope to as wide an audience as possible was to use the UK's astronomical societies, of which there are more than 200. So they asked us all to bid for interest, and a small number of us were going to be appointed to run this program. I'm pleased to say that one of the societies that was appointed was our own Norwich Astronomical Society. And one of the main reasons for this is that we are each being given an infrared camera. This is not to look at the night sky, but to familiarize audiences with the whole concept of infrared images. Um, we've had two nights of training. Uh, sorry, yes, two evenings of training. Originally, we were going to be trained at the observatory, but something called the COVID-19 pandemic uh, intervened and um, we're still hoping to go to the observatory next year and one of the things that my colleague Andrew who's an astrophotographer is working on at the moment is how to share the infrared images as a share on a zoom session so at some point in the future we'll be running sessions hopefully using the infrared uh, camera to show its capabilities So finally, this is us with our nice night skies, as you can see, down at Thwaite St. Mary. Uh, we're normally open to the public, and you would be most welcome to come along when we are. Unfortunately, we're not open at the moment. But when we are open, we will be obviously announcing that on all our social media. We use both Twitter and Facebook, and we've also got our own website as you can see here and finally thanks for your interest thank you very much i will now stop sharing and take a drink thank you roger that was really interesting Whew. <laughs> yes i mean i it's difficult difficult to know how to pitch it frankly you know but uh Did that perfectly? good excellent so you I think if anyone um, has it, ah, there are questions. So let me just have a look. Okay. Right, okay, yeah, the image the Google suggests. Okay, yeah, then. this is Jess, wow. Love the comment about the masks, yes. <laughs> okay, great. So that, uh, if anyone does, you know, 
when they go, I know you're at home mainly, if you're sitting at a, something called a computer or something like that, and you suddenly think of a question, I know what I'm going to suggest is that you email it to um, Alex, who can then forward it to me. How's that? Is that okay? Yeah. So yeah, that's more than okay. Or in the Discord, we do have a couple of questions actually from. Okay. Discord. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. So the first one is: Do they test the actual telescope deploying before they send it up? Yeah. No. <laughs> That's Just, a very straightforward it works. Um, it's, it's almost impossible to do so. But what they have done is they have done an enormous amount of testing in, in vacuum chambers. They've used um, shaking systems to shake the thing backwards and forwards to uh, simulate, I was going to say stimulate, but simulate, you know, the activity of the launch. Because, as Alex said before we started, the launch is, is quite tasty in its own right. We're going up to about 8G, I would imagine, on an Ariane launch. So they've tested all that. And then uh, one of the interesting things was the MIRI system, which is the one I was talking about that was developed here in Europe and part of it at the ROE, was that they, these subsystems came from all over Europe. There were Dutch ones, German ones, no prizes for guessing that the German one was a camera, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, so they came from all over and they were integrated in Edinburgh before they went to the States. And they all worked the first time. So that, and in, there was one of the engineers who actually was giving a presentation to us quite recently. He said it was the first time in his 30 years experience that that had ever happened, that everything, you know, had aligned and fitted and so on and so forth the very first time. So uh, I know it, this is now a long answer to a short question, of course, but I think they did everything but the actual deployment itself. So does the deployment rely on kind of the, I'm, I'm going to probably show my ignorance here, but lack of gravity and stuff like that? Um, for it, like, are the motors geared up to <laughs> not? Deal well, it does it? have motors, yes. But I mean, that that part of the thing, the unfolding, is a fairly common process in in space engineering. I mean, it's yeah. done a lot, um, and there's been a lot of experience. But I there's a very good example taking place at the moment: the Chinese with their um, their spacecraft that's landed on the moon to take samples and then fire them up come back into orbit around the moon, orbit of the vehicle, pass the samples over, and then come back to Earth. So that kind of thing is pretty complicated anyway. So, so there's a lot of experience in this. And if you think about the Mars rovers, for example, the way they unfold and so on and so forth. And of course, the other thing you've got to remember about that is this unfolding of the web is going to be a fairly leisurely process. When you're re-entering, when you're entering the atmosphere of a planet at several thousand miles an hour, that's not that's not how it happens. It all happens very quickly, but it still works. So I mean, there's a there's there's a high level of confidence, shall we say, that um, the unfolding should work, even <laughs> if it hasn't been tested before. You had another question there. Yeah, with a scope at L two, how do you deal with solar flares? Yes, well, that is why, yeah, um, two things about that. First of all, the really large solar flares are predictable, but only, say, about 48 hours in advance or 24 hours in advance. If the spacecraft is on its way to its final orbit, which will take quite a considerable amount of time, several weeks, um, the spacecraft can be protectively reorientated so that, as it were, the radiation proof bit is facing the flare, basically. Um, and as I, as, as I said in the talk, the computer systems are heavily radiation hardened. So they should be protected anyway. I mean, if you think about it again, um, it takes between seven or eight months to get from Earth orbit to Mars. And during that time, there are going to be a number of solar flares. And so the techniques have been pretty well developed to deal with those. 
the short term ones, but the shortest term warning you probably get is about 12 hours. Um, it's, it's normally longer than that, but that's probably the shortest term. And within that period of time, even going to Mars, I mean, the signal delay to Mars is about 12 to 14 minutes, but to the Lagrange point, it's going to be much less. So that should work okay. But it's a very good question. Yeah. Solar flares. If I am right, Rich, oh, well, there's a question about Rich if you know. Well, the rate of it, it um, if I'm right, redshift measures the speed objects who are moving away from us. That's a very interesting question. How do they distance away from us? Okay, look, I tell you what, James, James Cuthbert, um, can I, Alex? Yeah. Could you <laughs> mail that question? To me, I'm suffering from brain fatigue. <laughs> I, I, I just need to check the answer. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll get back good. to you. I'll get back to you over the weekend. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, so sure. I sure. really I'll need to check the answer because I don't. I don't want to send you an answer which is just an off-cuff answer, and you say, "Hmm, that doesn't sound quite right." <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Very good. Let me see that had at least one of those questions, that's really good. I right. think that will be the end of the stream. So I'm just going to end the YouTube stream. So if you just hold on one second. Yep, sure. Thanks everyone for joining. I really enjoyed